Welcome to the Glenn Mercer Show, where we talk all things vegan. If you're not already vegan, no worries, we'll get you there. If you are, tune in for health advice, information on climate change, and all the damage done by our most destructive industry, animal agriculture. We'll also talk cooking, theater, film, and culture. My two reasons for starting this podcast, to entertain, to inform, and to make people vegan. Oh, that's three. Shit. Hello and welcome to the Glenn Mercer Show. You can find us across all your favorite podcast platforms. You could find us at YouTube. Please remember to subscribe. And you can find us at realmeneatplants.com. We have a very special guest today, a man I'm honored to call a friend. He is an icon of the plant-based movement uh, he has a website at drclapper.com. Now you have to spell out the word doctor, D-O-C-T-O-R, Clapper, K-L-A-P-E-R.com. Another website at movingmedforward.com. That stands for Moving Medicine Forward, which he'll tell us about. Dr. Clapper, welcome to the show. Thank you, Glenn. It's great to be with you and your viewers. Now, you really are an icon of the movement because you were one of the first doctors to practice plant-based medicine in America. Uh, a generation or a generation and a half before you was Nathan Pritikin, who wasn't quite on the vegan team, right? But he was getting close. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, and was there anyone else in Pritikin's time? Oh, um, there was uh, Dr. Walter Kempner at Duke mm -hmm. University, uh, who reversed disease by putting people on a very high carbohydrate diet, uh, rice uh -huh. and fruits, and uh, got great results from it. And uh, those, uh, and their immediate uh, uh, successors, I guess, would be Dr. John McDougall and and the crew that came you know, immediately just before me. Uh, but uh, no, it'd just be uh, Dr. Kempner and uh, and Nathan Pritikin were the two main lights that I was aware of during during the late fifties, early sixties. Now uh, you mentioned Dr. McDougall, but, but then you said the crew that came just before you. What what crew is that? Well, uh, Dr. McDougall um, wrote his wonderful book, The McDougall Plan and McDougall's uh -huh. Medicine, nineteen eighty. Two, which is just when I was coming into the uh, into the plant based awareness, uh, he had already been there for a year, so I, I really have to uh, acknowledge that. Uh, and I believe he, um, well, clearly uh, Dr. Esselstyn uh, was already on the trail. He published his studies not too far after that, but uh, it would really be Dr. McDougall was was the main pioneer. That, uh, kind of blazed a trail for me. Mm -hmm. And how did you learn about Dr. McDougall? Quite by accident, quite fortuitous. I was uh, working in a, at a clinic in Central Florida, and one Saturday morning I was driving home, and I heard uh, I heard this interview on the radio about this doctor uh, describing a phenomenon that I'd never heard about reversing disease. I never thought high blood pressure could be reversed. Uh, and plant-based diets. And uh, as one who had become a, recently an, an ethical vegan, basically, boy, this was music to my ears. I keened like a, like a hound uh, on the scent there. Uh, who is this guy? By the time I got home, uh, I had learned his name, Dr. McDougall. I called the radio station before he left. And I, uh, it was uh, very open and uh, friendly. And we had a nice connection on the phone. And uh, he was glad to hear another doctor had heard the broadcast, and he sent me his book. And uh, we became fast friends. That was 1982, three, somewhere around there. And, and uh, do the math, that was 40 years ago. And uh, I'm uh, fortunate to count him as a friend even today. Now, here's the extraordinary thing. Dr. McDougall and you were two of the first to practice really... I know Dr. McDougall doesn't love to use the word, but vegan, plant-based, whole food medicine in America. And now it's 41 years later, we have the Plantrition Project, 
We have the College of Lifestyle Medicine. We have thousands of doctors who have followed your lead. So that's that's quite an advance. Talk about moving medicine forward. You are to be congratulated on that, sir. You helped spearhead a movement that now has thousands of doctors helping patients. Does my heart good if I had any small role to play in that. I, I <laughs> still a, stand on the shoulders of giants, as they say. You had a large role to play in that. Now, um, we're going to talk about the medical system in America today. Um, but, you know, my mother taught me, always say something good about someone before you criticize them. And my mother was a sweet, kind-hearted, gentle, caring, if somewhat wacky woman. You notice how I said the good things first? <laughs> I caught that, yes. Okay. So... Let's say, let me, I'll start. When I think of the medical system in America today, I one of the first, first things I think of is during the COVID pandemic, when thousands and thousands of people, and you know, I, I make it sound like that's past tense. It isn't quite past tense. Uh, but at the worst, when there were thousands and thousands of people dying per week, I would see the national news coverage of doctors and importantly, nurses and other healthcare professionals. And they were working around the clock, 24 hour, 48 hour shifts, trying to save people. And sometimes they lost their own lives doing so. So there are many tens of thousands of highly dedicated, caring doctors out there who are doing their best. Okay, I said my positive thing. <laughs> I'll get. I'll, I'll. I'll give you your chance. Let's say something positive about the medical community. Oh well, I hold them in just the highest regard. They are my family, my teachers, my colleagues, my brethren and sister in in arms, uh, trying to. Uh, relieve suffering in this world and extend life and extend the qu quality uh, of our to our existence. And uh, indeed, uh, the people who go into the healing professions um, in the driving force in their heart uh, is a desire to to heal, to make things better. And to see it manifest in so many different ways, all the different medical specialties, but the nurses, the physiotherapists, the um, the, the the cleaners in the hospital that uh, I heard a lovely interview with one of the cleaners sweeps the floor. I said, what do you do? He says, oh, I heal people. Um, I'm here to uh, to help people heal. And, and so anyone who goes in this profession uh, has a place of reverence in, in my heart. And the medical profession itself it's stunning. As one who's been involved in acute care medicine, all the hours I spent in the operating rooms, emergency rooms, to see people uh, desperately hurt and injured and deathly ill from sepsis, pulled back from the jaws of death you know, by dedicated people and brilliant technology, who people who thought of these wonderful drugs and devices, bless them all. There's a place in heaven for all of them. And so thank heavens for, for Western medicine and all the miracles that it works on a daily basis and those people who actually do the medicine at all hours of the day and night. Um, again, they are uh, they are saints among us. Now, and But they're human and they have their foibles and failings. I'm not saying they're, they're perfect people, but the discipline itself brings out the highest in humanity. And, and for that reason, I hold it in great reverence. All right. So we have established that you hold the, the discipline in great reverence, and there are good people out there working hard to heal people. Having said that, what grade from A to F would you give the medical profession in America today? Oh, my. When it comes to the completion of the mission they all hold to, to deliver healthcare that really leaves people healthier, 
Um, and again, someone said the, the highest form of medicine is teaching people how not to need it, not to need the medicine of the doctors. Um, I have to give give us a, a D minus, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we we just uh, don't follow through. We we can keep people from dying, but as far as getting them on the road to true health, which of course involves what they're eating and how they're living their, their diet, uh, living their daily lives, um, we uh, we've really neglected that area. And so, without the follow through, you you can. Uh, you can be in the lead in the Indianapolis 500, but if you don't make it those last 500 yards over the finish line, you might as well not have run the race there. And, and too often we do these bypasses and these dramatic procedures, but we then send the patient out uh, to uh, to fall back into the, the pit of disease there. And that uh, that uh, foils the, uh, the success of the entire mission there. So we've got, we're a long way from the those crucial yards to the finish line there. And that's the major problem. And would you say that that is in large part because doctors in America are trained in disease, but they're not trained in health? Uh, your your author and poet uh, comes <laughs> through with that pithy uh, summary. That's exactly right. We are great. We are great disease hawks. Boy, we are trained to diagnose uh, early signs of disease and put a name on it and describe the pathology and and even come up with some therapies to try and reverse it. But as far as getting to the cause of what really caused the problem, well, we pull back there and how to keep it from recurring, we pull back there. And so uh, we're, we're great on disease, but and and when I was growing up in the 1950s and 60s, that was, that was enough. It'd be, boy, if you could cure that pneumonia, if you could cut out that cancer, mission accomplished. Uh, but of course, there's a lot more to healing than that. And yeah. uh, we are, we've got a long way to go to finish the picture there. And uh, so when you went to medical school, you were taught about disease. You were taught mm -hmm. about hypertension. You were taught about cardiovascular disease. You were taught about inflammatory conditions. And what were you told was the cause of these conditions? Well, as you open up uh, Robinson's uh, textbook of pathology or Schwartz's uh, textbook of surgery or Harrison's textbook of internal medicine, uh, there's each of these disease entities. And uh, uh, after the introductory paragraph, you get to this uh, section called etiology. What, what's the cause? What's the source? Where does it come from? Uh, and uh, again and again, I noticed then and still notice that you run into, uh, in so many words, uh, the the basic what is it, what is this, a cop out that's not a very scientific or flattering term but you run into these two concepts of of etiology unknown we don't know the cause it probably has something to do with genetics something to do with the environment maybe stress plays a role but we really don't understand the cause of and then fill in there's a blank there fill in the disease whether it's autoimmune disease clogged arteries high blood pressure diabetes we don't really know the genetics, probably environment, probably stress, but we really don't know. And and if you're an erstwhile medical student, you have to accept that. Well, the smart guys who wrote the book don't know why. Uh, then I certainly couldn't know that. And uh, as the years go by, you know, you get this tacit, uh, condescending uh, pat on the head, if you will, that. We don't know the cause, but rest assured, there are these smart scientists in the research lab at NIH and Harvard, 24 hours a day, they're working in those labs, looking at those, swirling those beakers and running those test tubes, and, and they're getting close. They're getting One day close. they'll figure out what causes cardiovascular. One day they'll figure out. <laughs> and, uh, okay, all right, let me know when you come up with, with, the, uh, with the understanding of it. And as but far as you know, are they still saying in medical schools about these diseases, etiology unknown? Vast majority. 
because that's what keeps the research money going. And that's a little cynical. But if you if we're, we're getting close, but we don't know the exact cause, but I, we've got a study that may elucidate another mechanism by which this gene turns on this enzyme, which uh, inhibits this substrate, which uh, in, facilitates this reaction, which changes the membrane potential, which induces this enzyme. To, and, and if we can interfere with this one, we might be able to uh, to stop the process. So give us another $100,000 for the study and we'll let you know what, what we find. Uh, but still, have they really gotten to the etiology? No, they haven't. They're just they're like the watchmaker who's just tinkering with the gearing and, uh, and uh, trying to understand what they're seeing, but they're not understanding the entire picture. As you and I both know, somebody should write a medical textbook. It should be in every medical school in America, and it should be called Etiology Unknown My Ass. Because <laughs> we know the causes of these diseases. So let me tell my listeners that Dr. Clapper has a nonprofit called Moving Medicine Forward. Again, you could find it at movingmedforward.com. You could also learn about Dr. Clapper and about that, that organization at drclapper.com. And the point of moving medicine forward is to stop this insanity in which young doctors are not taught about health and not taught the causes of disease and not taught about the reversibility of disease, which you would think would be important to the medical profession. So without further ado, Dr. Clapper, tell our listeners, tell any young medical students out there, tell anyone with a conscience who might be running a medical school, what is the cause of heart disease and hypertension and, and uh, inflammatory conditions often and so many other diseases that are plaguing our population? In three words, if I had to, someone put a gun to my head, tell us the truth. What is the secret of causing these diseases? It's the food. It's the it's food. Words that Dr. What? McDougall have, has been known to say as well. Absolutely. I credit him with the original uh, putting together that phrase. It's the food that people are pouring through their tissues hour after hour, day after day. Uh, simply the wrong fuel for this human body. Uh, to run on, and the arteries clog, and inflammation happens, and uh, and and people get these diseases. But again, it's uh, quite predictable. If if you put diesel fuel, put kerosene into a gasoline burning engine, you can't be surprised when black smoke comes out the tailpipe and the spark plugs cake up with carbon, and the engine stops. Uh, wrong fuel uh, for that engine. And the same thing. We are plant eating hominids, like the gorillas. Uh, and uh, no gorilla eats flesh three times a day. If they did, they would develop the same disease as we do. And in the zoos, that's what happens into captive gorillas. They die of clogged arteries and diabetes. But out but in the are wild, are they feeding them cheeseburgers? They're what? feeding them uh, the, some type of chow that has meat in it. And, You're kidding uh, me! They feed no. meat to gorillas in zoos. In indeed, I got why in the world would they do that? Got to have protein. You're a big, strong guy. And, they want to make uh, and, gorillas big and strong? You're kidding. Uh, talk about insanity. Uh, and But that's what gorillas die of. When, when you look at cause of death in gorillas in captivity, it's clogged arteries and diabetes. But out in the wild, they die of they have injuries and parasites and trauma and infections uh, from living out there without medical care. But they don't die of the so-called diseases of civilization. If that's not a lesson... Uh, you know, it's uh, hard to hard to overlook that one. And 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 you know another thing that I find hard to overlook. There's one species that gets atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. There's one species, us. Indeed. Because every other species knows what to eat. Indeed. Herbivores like the rabbit, they right. know not to eat cheeseburgers, so they never Indeed. do. You have never seen. Have you ever seen a rabbit online at McDonald's? No, they no, they no, come they to think of it. I haven't. No, no, they yeah, they, right. they eat grass and stuff like that. Indeed, um, herbivores don't eat meat, so they don't get atherosclerosis. And carnivores eat meat, and they can't get it because they're designed to eat meat. 
we are the single species stupid enough to eat like carnivores when we're herbivores. And so we're the only species, I thought we were the only species, but apparently gorillas in captivity in the zoo, we've also managed to torture them and give them heart disease, apparently. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that, but that Mm -hmm. is shocking. Mm -hmm. So, So, you know, this is so easy to figure out, isn't it? You would think for, you know, the word homo sapiens, uh, sapient means wise. If you're sapient, right. you're wise. Uh, the wise one, homo sapien. Well, talk about an unwise thing to right. do uh, is to eat the food like mountain lions. We are not mountain lions. We are herbivores, as you say. Now, you have a wonderful video that people can find on your website yes. uh, called What I Wish I Learned in Medical School. Right, about nutrition. And you talk in that about the red tide of poisons that go through the system when people foolishly eat animal foods. Could you do for us a a, a five-minute version of that, a short version of that, of what happens when people eat meat three times a day? What goes through their system? Right. Well, I have a slide in the presentation um, to show what your blood looks like after you eat a cheeseburger and a milkshake, how fatty the blood appears and stays away for a good five hours. And during those five hours of fat in the blood, the arteries are injured, obesity increases, uh, insulin resistance gets worse, inflammation gets worse. Uh, and it takes about five hours for that effect to wash out just in time for the next fatty meal. And so if you have bacon and eggs for breakfast and a cheeseburger for lunch and chicken for dinner and ice cream for dessert, you're keeping your blood fatty all day. And so hour after hour, the arteries are injured or obesity is increasing. Diabetes is getting worse. Uh, And that's just from from the fat. But also, I've got a slide of the various specific problems that meat produces uh, in the the human body. Uh, Nobody eats raw meat. The very act of cooking the, the the meat, of grilling the burger, of broiling the steak, frying the chicken, oxidizes the cholesterol in the animal's muscle. So when you bite into that burger, the chicken breast, all this oxidized cholesterol floods through your tissues and invades the walls of the arteries and sets up the process of atherosclerotic plaque formation. Uh, the, the very act of cooking the burger uh, creates cancer-causing substance, carcinogens that smear on the stomach wall, giving gastric cancers, and on the colon wall, giving colon cancers. Um, uh, new 5-GC is a sialic acid that only animals make, uh, and it drives inflammation in all the tissues of the body, and our paleo friends are giving themselves a shot of new 5-GC three times a day. Uh, 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 the uh, all the slaughterhouse bacteria that coat every steak and chop and turkey breast uh, that uh, that releases a substance called endotoxin. These bacteria die, and the endotoxin makes the gut leaky uh, and and opens the door to autoimmune diseases. Um, when you eat meat, the body, the liver responds by putting out a surge of insulin-like growth factor one, this very powerful uh, growth-promoting hormone that drives cancer growth throughout the body. Uh, The animals in the feedlots are fed grains that are sprayed with herbicides and pesticides that concentrate into the animal's muscle along with the antibiotics they're fed. So you bite into that burger and all the herbicides and pesticides, the heavy metals and the water the animals drink, all that floods through your tissues. There's nine of these contaminants that flood through the tissues with every meat-based meal. So that bacon at breakfast, that burger at lunch, that chicken at dinner, uh, continually floods the uh, system with these toxins. And and um, the, the body reacts, the, the, the consistency of this. If you eat three meals a day over the course of a year, over a thousand times a year, you have flooded your tissues uh, with, uh, with these toxic molecules. So no wonder the arteries get inflamed, they clog up, the, uh, uh, the cancers are initiated, autoimmune diseases op- uh, announce themselves from the autoimmune disease. The whole cascade of diseases that every doctor faces when they open the waiting room uh, in their clinic, in the emergency room, in surgical outpatient, who's sitting there? Mr. and Mrs. America 
overweight, hypertensive, diabetic, clogged up and inflamed from what they're eating every four hours. It's not that hard to understand, but uh, ooh, with, with doctors don't want to look at that because I uh, guess what's, what's the doctor eating? And the doctors don't know anything about nutrition. And, and what happens if I talk to them about nutrition and they get healthy? Uh, am I going to be a little left without patients? There's so many reasons. Doctors do not want to open that door marked what your patient is eating, yeah, Mark nutrition. and But it's the ultimate tragedy driving so much disease and suffering among our people that we can't let the situation stand any longer. And it's precisely because of podcasts like this. The issue, the issue we've got enough scientific studies. Plant-based diets are healthy for it. It's education. It's, it's getting the public to be aware and accepting of plant-based nutrition as the key to, to reverse diseases and creating a truly healthy body and, and lifetime. Uh, the issue you're, sir, uh, and your colleagues uh, doing these podcasts are the real healers of our society at this time because it gets this information out so people accept plant-based nutrition. Oh, yeah, sure. I, I don't need much meat at all anymore. But I'm going plant-based and I feel great. Those are the words we want to hear coming out of our our, our friends and, and loved ones' uh, lips. Well, the, the thousands of doctors who have now followed your lead and are practicing plant-based medicine, which means that they talk to their patients about what they're eating and they give them some advice about what they should eat and they recommend plants. Yes, it's, it's, it's really reassuring. And uh, every time I go to a meeting at the Plantrician Project, you literally see hundreds and hundreds of doctors from around the world, from Indonesia and India and Ireland and uh, Scotland, Canada. Uh, and, and, and I'm in awe of the fact that this profound truth, the healing power of plant-based diet, that light has gone on in the heads of all these hundreds of different doctors who've each arrived at the same point by their own convoluted Yes, but and, the truth and, is the truth. Right. And that's and, the that's the really crucial point because they all arrived by their own path. None yes. of them were taught this in medical school. None. No. They all either read a book, saw a video, heard you speak, and they came to it. And then they realized, and then they changed their own diet. And then they said, This is working for me. It's going to work for my patients. Exactly. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there is not a countervailing movement of doctors who have come to the truth that it's eating sausages that makes you healthy and they've started sausage-based medicine. There isn't an opposing movement really other, other than a, a few paleo doctors maybe here and there. Well, yes, and actually all of what you just said is true. Um, by and large, you don't, I, I know of no studies showing that atherosclerotic plaque clogging artery will regress on a meat-based diet. If a person is eating meat <laughs> right. three times a day, their plaques get small. Nope, no. never seen a study, and I dare no. say you and never And you never will. will. But on um, the plant-based diet, absolutely. It, it's, yeah. it's what we expect to happen there. So, no, the science is solid there, but but science be darned. Uh, there's a lot of folks who are so invested in that way. Uh, real men eat meat, man. And we were our caveman ancestors, they buy into this paleo nonsense mythology uh, and they're advocating. And these are usually health, leaner, healthier guy in their 30s, aggressive kind of docs there. Eat your meat. It's good good for you. Um, and they're causing great, great harm, great damage. Right. Are they going to be around in 10 years, in 20 years when their patient following that meat-based diet passes their first bloody stool from the colon cancer. These, these docs won't be around for that. They're going to be around when the patient gets their stroke, going to be around when they get their autoimmune disease. And now they're off uh, counting their money from their latest nonsensical book that they published. Uh, but gr the, these docs are causing great harm by pushing these flesh-based diets. So, uh, so no, there are some doctors pushing it, and uh, and I view them not as allies, to say the least. They're, they're, they're really, you know, do no harm uh, applies to information as well. And I think these folks are, uh, are causing great harm with this misinformation. Well, Dr. Esselstyn did what I think was maybe the best study ever when he, he did two studies, but one was larger than the other, 
where he took a couple hundred patients with serious heart disease, many of whom the medical community was basically giving up on saying, you know, make your arrangements. Oh. Oh. Um, and he mm -hmm. put them on it, not just a vegan diet, but a whole food, sugar-free, oil-free, low-fat vegan diet. Correct. Um, a healthy vegan diet. And he reversed the heart disease and everyone who was compliant with his protocol did very well and survived and thrived. And there were a handful, maybe 5% or so, who weren't compliant and no, no luck with them. Um, mm -hmm. Those numbers are indisputable. And um, it's not a study of hundreds of thousands of people, but mathematically, when you have that many people, a couple hundred, and we know how many of them statistically would have died with no intervention. And when 10, 15, 20 years later, they're all doing very well, those who were compliant, that is mathematically highly um, significant. Mm -hmm. My question to you, Dr. Clapper, is if someone had proposed to the to the Cleveland Clinic, I want to do a study, give me your most severe heart patients. I want to put them on scrambled eggs, bacon, and sausages. Do you think that study would have been funded? And do you think anybody would have enrolled in it? And my point is, I think the science is settled. What, what do you say? Well, I'm certainly uh, predisposed to agree with you, of course. Uh, and uh, as you're saying, would uh, would anybody enroll? In, would anybody fund a, a egg and sausage study? Yeah, probably the egg and sausage <laughs> folks would. Uh, but uh, I can we can see. I know the results. You and I both both know them because. Uh, going back to the study you um, described, Dr. Esselstyn, it was profound. He had 198 men, you know, almost 200 men. All of them had severe clogged arteries, and they were end-stage disease. They were so clogged up, they couldn't even put a stent in these folks. They were, couldn't even find a place to bypass them. These were end-stage vascular folks, uh, 198 of them. He put them on that low-fat uh, plant-based diet and followed them for four years. And during those four years, statistically, at seven and a half percent per year, uh, during those four years, uh, those 200 men, um, 60 of them should have had statistically a, a major adverse cardiac event, MACE, a major adverse cardiac event. They would have had a heart attack, a stroke, mm -hmm. sudden death, angina, some, some bad thing would have happened to the heart, heart arteries. In four years, how many of those expected 60 had a major adverse cardiac event? None. All 198 of these guys uh, who who, may, who followed the diet, as you said, and not only escaped any major adverse cardiac event, uh, but those who had angina crushing chest pain when they walked, nine out of 10 of them, their angina went away. Uh, this is so profound. There was a pill that did that. We would be uh, trillionaires. You know, Dr. Esselstyn would be a very wealthy man now. Um, so the uh, the profundity of this of the physiology that was demonstrated here cannot be, as you say, you know, dismissed. This this is such a powerful demonstration. Uh, and that, and in, given that context, imagine running bacon and eggs and, and pizza uh, through these guys' arteries, uh, you know, three times a day. What that would have done to those statistics. Yeah. So, absolutely, this is a this is a real deal. This is re re reversing uh, artery disease. Yeah. Now. Dr. Esselstyn's study is a case of a very clear proof, as far as I'm concerned, of the uh, superiority of the whole food plant-based diet. Sometimes I see studies, often I see studies. They are self-reporting studies of 100,000 people reporting what they ate, and some of them claim to be vegans, and some of them say they're vegetarians, and some of them say they're pescatarians. And some of them say they're they're uh, paleo dieters, and they report what they ate all day long, and you get uh, you get a hundred different interpretations of the results. You get meta studies that incorporate their results, 
and scientists try to tease out the data. And I think it's all semi-pointless because first of all, they may not be remembering exactly what they eat. Second of all, even the, the, the vegans could have been people eating a junk food vegan diet and the paleo eaters could have been eating a, uh, the more vegetables than the, the, the vegans. Uh, and, um, you know, so it's, it's diets of, of so many people eating in such a confusing way, trying to remember what they ate, who knows how much Coca-Cola they're drinking and how many donuts they're having. And then you get a headline, oh, paleo diet, almost as good as vegan diet or whatever, or longevity, no difference or whatever. That's not a real study in my book. What do you say? Oh, absolutely. The, uh, nutrition has this anchor chain around it when it comes to scientific proof where uh, the, the folks uh, testing new pharmaceutical drugs, oh, they, they've got a great model there. You make up an active pill and a placebo pill that looks just like it. Don't tell the researcher or the patients uh, who's getting the, the active pill or the placebo. And you can do follow, give them the medicine for X period of time. And you can draw some valid conclusions uh, about that. But it doesn't. But when it comes to nutrition, and and many critics uh, of plant based diets, whatever, will stand there with their arms folded. Well, show me fifteen double blind placebo controlled studies showing me that proving that broccoli is healthier than Snickers bars. Um, well, you're not going to get those studies. People know what they're eating. You can't do a double blind study. People don't eat the same thing month after month, year after year. They. Uh, there's so many reasons why these nutrition studies just don't lend themselves to that uh, gold standard uh, placebo controlled model. Uh, and it's unfair to expect that for nutrition. So that drops down the nutrition researcher into a uh, an unsatisfactory set of tools there. And one of them are, the, are these epidemiologic studies where they look at lots and lots of people who, as you say, they self-report what they're eating, which already we know uh, is a very inaccurate thing. I can't remember what I had for lunch day before yesterday, let alone uh, in the past six months or whatever. Um, but very, very importantly, when they check the vegan, oh yes, vegan. Well, they went vegan two weeks ago because their diabetes was out of control, and uh, but but they're counted as the vegans. But when they get their uh, but again, they're drinking their cola drinks, whatever, and they get their blindness or their complications. As see that vegan diet didn't work for them. Well, uh, these people went vegan because they already had the disease. Uh, you know, and so there's so many problems with those kind of studies. Uh, I look at these studies, and they're and and the folks at Epic Oxford in, in England and other in the Seventh Day Adventists. Uh, I look at these studies, and they're and and. The folks at Epic Oxford in, in England and other in the Seventh-day Adventist studies trying to do these population studies, I give them lots of credit. But when I read the conclusions that vegan diets, you know, don't have any survival advantage with this uh, the disease and that disease, I talk about a grain of salt. I tell you, I have a large block of salt <laughs> that I throw over my shoulder on, on those ones because they're, they're just not valid studies. Uh, you have to look at specific diseases and uh, and the, the mechanisms by which it reverses these conditions. And by the way, um, thank you for calling your viewers' attention to my video on my website um, of my presentation, What I Wish I Learned in Medical School About Nutrition. We have also just posted uh, a second companion video called Mechanisms of Disease Reversal through plant-based nutrition. How does a plant-based diet actually reverse these diseases? How does it melt away plaque? How does it reverse type two diabetes? Show me the science. And so that is now available on our website. And uh, again, it's um, uh, mechanisms of disease reversal utilizing plant-based nutrition. Uh, look for it there if you want a little deeper dive into the science behind uh, how these uh, plant-based diets reverse diseases. All right, we'll take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back with Dr. Michael Clapper. If you want to optimize your health by following a plant-based, low-fat diet, look into the education, events, recipes, exercise, fun, and more provided by the Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group at pbnsg.org. All right, we are talking with Dr. Michael Clapper 
And uh, Dr. Clapper, when you were a resident in anesthesiology, you were in the room when heart patients were getting bypasses, angioplasties. What did you witness coming out of the arteries of the patients? Well, I had a good view of what the surgeon was seeing and doing. I was up at the head of the table uh, looking down into the chest incision uh, during these coronary artery bypasses. And uh, the surgeon uh, has to find an open area of the artery above the blockage and make a nick in the artery and, and plug uh, the uh, the vein that they're going to be grafting onto it uh, above the blockage. And then and then go down below the blockage and find another place to plug the, the vein into. Um, and inevitably, because we're doing these operations on people with badly clogged arteries, almost every place the surgeon made uh, this incision into the artery wall, uh, they'd encounter this fibrous plaque of yellow, thick, like congealed oatmeal uh, um, that the surgeon would have to, uh, to dissect off the walls there and, and pull out a chunk of it. Uh, like uh, like a sausage casing uh, or coming out of a sausage casing, if you will. Um, and uh, the, the procedure is called an endarterectomy, uh, which is to remove the inner lining of the arteries. And I got a good look at the at what I thought was the cause of the disease when caring for a patient of mine who was scheduled for a four-vessel bypass. He had been out with his family uh, a few days before the surgery, uh, and when he came back, the nurse asked me to draw some blood on the man uh, for a test. And I drew the blood on the fella, and the, the blood uh, floating in his tube was thick and greasy white, like Elmer's glue. It stuck to the side of the tube when I shook it. I went back to the man. I said, what, did, when you were out with your family, did you eat? Said, yes. What would you eat? All right, a cheeseburger and a milkshake. When he said that, I realized what I was looking at was, was all the fat in the burger, the butter fat and the cheese, the egg yolk and the mayonnaise on the bun, now all and the fat and the meat, of course. All this fat had turned his blood fatty uh, and is, it stays that way for hours. And so two days later, when we took him to the operating room and saw his chest open and pull that stuff out of his arteries, uh, the light bulb went on, the sirens wailed and the and the bells clanged in my head, doctor, what, what do you think you're going to see it there? What do you think that's coming from? And uh, science is pretty logical. A moves B, which causes C to, you know, to, to happen. Uh, well, the, what people are eating, is, is, you know, I saw what it was doing to their liquid blood, and I sure saw what it was doing to their arteries. At that point, you know, you can't unring the bell. You know, you can't pretend you don't know what's behind the curtain at that point. And and it all just opened up from there. So much of, uh, when I went back to the wards, the obesity, the diabetes, the clotted arteries, it all, it's the food. <laughs> it became so blatantly obvious that you start seeing it everywhere. Once you see it, you see it everywhere. And yet they say etiology mm -hmm. unknown. It's just remarkable. Dr. Clapper, I'm sure somebody must have gotten the idea to take that gunk that was pulled out of the arteries and examine it under a microscope. What would they have found that it was composed of? Uh, generally, uh, cholesterol, saturated fat, oxidized uh, cells. Um, it's largely the fat of these people, of the, uh, the, largely the fat of the animals these people are eating. If you give these people meat where the cholesterol is radioactively labeled, the radioactive labeled cholesterol winds up in the plaque of the arteries. It's uh, It's clearly related to the diet that people are eating. So, so can we come up with a theory for, to explain the fact that we know what it is, we know what that yellow gunk is, we've looked at it under a microscope, and yet in medical school, they say etiology unknown. What are the possible explanations for this willful ignorance? Indeed. Um... The author uh, Upton Sinclair said it's difficult to convince a man of a truth uh, when his paycheck uh, depends upon him not seeing that truth. Uh, and uh, and we have so many researchers uh, these days uh, who are on the trail of the cause of heart disease, but it gets to this 
intellectual minefield of, of food, of diet. And the fact is that there are powerful forces looming over the head and hearts of researchers uh, and their funders. Uh, and without getting into conspiracy theories, we can't pretend that the, the major economic drivers of so much of medical science, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, the meat industry, the hospital industry, the, uh, uh, the insurance industry, now, all these people are making tremendous amounts of money off the current system. And many of these people are, uh, are knee deep, stomach deep, if you will, uh, into this uh, manner of eating. Um, the uh, What is the researcher who's doing a study actually having for lunch and dinner? If he likes his cheeseburgers and spare ribs, uh, it's going to be hard for him to design a study showing that meat and spare ribs uh, cause disease of any type. And so uh, the, uh, the economics uh, uh, drive so much of the science we're seeing. You know, who's ever paying for the research gets the results that they, they, they're paying for. <laughs> and so uh, the, the game's fairly, fairly tilted. And, no one, and there's no money in eating broccoli. And, uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a real problem. Big broccoli is not sponsoring uh, these studies, but big meat and dairy are. Yeah, but of course, there are trillions of dollars of savings really? to be had if people would eat the broccoli instead of the cheeseburger. Exactly. Uh, um, uh, the, the, now, back at the back at the beginning of this broadcast, uh, I expressed my admiration for the hardworking doctors who were on the front lines trying to save lives during COVID. But I want to also give the full picture of that now, too. We, we do have a study that was uh, pretty uh, important done by BMJ, uh, formerly British Medical Journal, that showed, I believe it was 72% reduced risk of, of, uh, of death and, uh, and uh, severe COVID in people on a, quote, plant-based diet. Now, I don't know what they meant by plant-based. I'm sure it wasn't the Dr. Esselstyn protocol, but it was presumably more plants than most people eat, less animals than most people eat. So on a plant-based diet, 72% reduced risk of death. And we've had over a million deaths from COVID. So that's over three quarters of a million lives that could have been saved if when COVID hit, we seized the opportunity and we all went on a plant-based diet. And if the Surgeon General had advised us to do so, and if Anthony Fauci had advised us to do so, and if the CDC director had advised us to do so, and I would see on the news these hardworking doctors, some of whom were obese, working all night long to try to save the obese patients. And then sometimes the obese doctors lost their lives. And I feel very sorry for them. And they were good, well-meaning people. But the obesity in this country is what gave us the terrible results that we got with COVID. Um, COVID was a disease that targeted meat eaters. It targeted, to, still targets to this day, the obese and people on a fatty Western diet. So at what point does the medical community say, maybe we should do our jobs correctly and teach people how to be healthy so they can stay healthy and survive? What can we all do to teach the medical community? Now, you're doing more than anyone else with moving medicine forward. But what can we all do to teach the medical community to do their jobs correctly and teach people how to be healthy? Such an important question. And thank you for mentioning the work we're doing through moving medicine forward, just for your patients, your patients, your viewers who may not be uh, familiar um, uh, what, uh, several years ago, when I realized the power 
of plant-based nutrition to reverse diseases and that no one is mentioning this to the young doctors. I'm saying somebody should tell this to the medical students before pharmacosclerosis sets into their brains. Now, and, let's uh, repeat that word. Pharmacosclerosis. So where you coined, pharmacosclerosis. <laughs> It's a clapperism. I made that yes, word. Up, define it, that for our listeners. Right. If something is sclerotic, it's hardened. Uh, and pharmacosclerosis is the, the belief that drugs and surgery are the only treatments for disease. And it, and it hardens into the, into the uh, mental framework of physicians as they go through med school. You make your diagnosis and it's just a matter of what uh, what drugs or what surgery um, you're going to prescribe for the patients as, as pharmacosclerosis. Never a thought given to what the patient is eating and uh, and the, or a thought of that this is a reversible disease and can be done, uh, can be reversed by what the patient is eating. Never mentioned uh, to the patients when it's so, it's to the young students when it's so important so I said, somebody ought to be telling the young med students this. And the little voice on my shoulder said, how about you, doc? And so for the past almost four years, I've been going to the medical schools and giving this lecture on what I wish I had learned in medical school about nutrition. I wish someone had told me this before I waded into the outpatient clinic there, the uh, etiology unknown in my head. Uh, and uh, so uh, I'm trying to reach the medical students directly and the young doctors and we, we uh, hold uh, monthly seminars and we're, we're trying to keep this fire going uh, in the minds and hearts of as many young doctors as we can. But to your point, uh, and, and if someone would like to support our work, by the way, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. If you'd like to help us, we have expenses. Uh, go to movingmedforward.com, as, as Glenn told you, and uh, see what we're doing and see how you can help. Thank you for letting me get that uh, that word in. Um, as far as what can patients do, first of all, you, if you're uh, paying, if you're watching this video, you are so far ahead of your physician's awareness as far as food goes uh, that the best thing to do is just do this yourself. Eat a healthy plant-based diet and get yourself lean, healthy. Shuck these diseases. If you have high blood pressure, that'll go down. If you have diabetes, your blood sugars will go down. Get yourself uh, in a healthy plant-based diet body so you can uh, be a good example to the people around you and, and your doctor when you go in uh, for your annual check or whenever you see them. So first of all, do it yourself. Your doctor, uh, there are body repair guys and girls, and God love them. If you break your arm, go find a good doctor and get your arm fixed. But as far as asking them about health, we they don't teach us that in med school. And so don't ask your doctor, expect your doctor to give you great guidance there. Um, so it's up to you to bring in a good example of a healthy body. And there are handouts and books now. Go to Dr. McDougall's website on, uh, on what to tell your doctor. You can go to his newsletter. Uh, we're going to post a similar article on our Moving Med Forward uh, website. Just a two-page handout to bring to your doctor to uh, with studies showing that these are reversible diseases. Uh, and, and read about yourself. Get on, uh, as I said, Dr. McDougall's uh, mailing list. Uh, get on our mailing list. Uh, uh, follow Dr. Michael Greger and his nutritionfacts.org. Uh, and so educate yourself. Uh, so when you uh, go talk to your doctor, and you're going to, the doctor's going to need education. If you are on medication for blood pressure, diabetes, those are soon going to be too powerful for you. And you've got to, the doctor's going to have to lower the doses. They're going to have to de prescribe these medications. So uh, be aware of that. And, and, yeah, and if you start showing side effects from your blood pressure pill or your diabetes medicine, call the doctor's office. I'm getting lightheaded when I stand up. Do you think we should be reducing this blood pressure pill? Uh, or I'm, my blood sugar is going down to the 50s. I think we should cut back on the insulin. And uh, and the doctors will learn this way. You know, it's, it's an old adage. You know, the doctor learns best from their patients. Uh, they're our best teachers. So it's your chance to educate your doctors. So most important thing, do it yourself. So you don't have to go to see the doctor in the first place. You know, I never see, if I didn't have to see a doctor in the mirror every morning, I, I'd never see you myself. Uh, that, that's all good advice. And do you think it's the case that those nutritional studies we were talking about before, a, a, a few of them, very good ones, like 
like uh, the ones Dr. Esselstyn has done, and many of them very ambiguous, uh, poorly designed studies that come to ambiguous information. Um, and, you know, I would say in general, there are far more studies that show an advantage to the plant to plant based eating than to the other side. So, as you point out, Dr. Greger's site is full of information about studies that point to the superiority of eating fruits, vegetables, mushrooms, whole grains. So there's plenty of evidence in nutritional studies, but then there are also those other nutritional studies that, that are perhaps intentionally cloudy. And there are no studies uh, that I know of that show uh, definitively that vegans live, let's say, 10 years longer than meat eaters. Um, and again, that could be in part because some people, as you say, come to the vegan diet when they're 70 and they have heart disease. It could be in part that some people are vegans who eat pretzels and donuts and, and don't have a healthy vegan diet. They're animal rights vegans and they just care about not eating meat. They don't care about being healthy. Um, and it could be just that, uh, you know, no good studies have been done of people on the kind of diet that Dr. Esselstyn enforced uh, versus any kind of paleo diet. So we don't have that study. Since we don't have um, a, a complete, a world of completely clear studies like the Esselstyn study, since we have enough vague studies, that kind of gives ammunition to the medical schools to say, well, we don't really know. This study here said there's no real difference between pe people eating plants and people eating meat. This study here showed an advantage to eating a little fish. This study here showed an advantage to low fat dairy. And they could make the case that they're confused. And what I would say is, well, you don't just look at the studies. You look at all the evidence. You look at the uh, evolutionary evidence. You look at comparative anatomy. Uh, and you look at the best of the studies, like the Esselstyn study, the ones that really put people on a healthy diet. Um, and then you have solid proof, indisputable proof that, and you looked at, you look at reversibility of disease. When is anybody reversing any diseases with sausages? You look at the blood pressure studies, nobody's blood pressure goes healthfully down on, on hamburger, you know? So when you put all that proof together, then then it's it's indisputable that the diet that we're advocating is the healthiest human diet but th but they they have enough deniability to not to not go that far you think that's part of the problem oh absolutely absolutely again you know you it's it rocks the boats it makes you such an iconic iconoclast to say stop eating meat stop eating animal products stop eating dairy eat all american foods uh, right away your you know your funding stops you get nasty letters from your boss and the public and the patients it's a scary thing that people don't want to open that box and wade into that bramble patch um, but the truth is the truth and uh, we are plant eating hominids uh, gorillas in the wild do not get diabetes. They don't get clogged arteries. Well, we need to follow their example. And so, uh, the you know, the, who are you kidding? The body, uh, there's no talking the body out of forming plaques in your arteries uh, if you're damaging them three times a day. Uh, the, your body doesn't care about the studies. It just cares about the next meal that's coming in. And as long as it's made of plants, you're you're, you're going to be healthy from that. And, uh, and as you say, it's a definitive treatment for obesity and diabetes. Uh, the, the truth is all around us, but many people just don't want to see it. Now, speaking of obesity, there's a new fad that has overtaken our land, and it's called Ozempic 
And I think something else called Wigovi, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And these are, as I understand it, pills that were designed for diabetes. And people said they started losing weight when they took them. Yep. So tell us if this is a good idea to take I those wish I could tell you It's a good idea. It's a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea. Tell us why. Oh, my. It's so sad. We, we human uh, homo sapiens, it's, it's, it would be funny if it weren't so sad and, and pathetic and wasteful. Um, um, these uh, medicines, and most of them are given by injection once a week uh, to, and it was meant for diabetes people who, uh, it, it increases the, the action of insulin. Uh, that's all well and good. And, but it was incidentally, no, these people lost weight and suddenly the weight loss aspect overshadowed anything it did with with blood sugar. Uh, and that's, uh, as you watch the commercials at six o'clock in the evening, that's what, what people are focusing on. Uh, but the problem, there, there's several problems uh, with the whole uh, concept. Uh, one, the, the mechanism, the, the, these drugs make you feel sick. They're, they give you a low-grade nausea. They, uh, um, they uh, uh, cause uh, often diarrhea and Cramps and uh, they're they're really uh, affecting the uh, function of the uh, of the intestinal tract uh, adversely. A small um, price to pay to lose weight. I'm sure a small price to pay. You would think millions of um, Americans are saying. But a but a price is not so small. Is the cost of a thousand dollars a month um, mm -hmm. for a a, a medicine um, that will yeah you'll lose 15, 18 pounds. Uh, and then it plateaus. Then you stop losing the weight, but you're still paying a thousand dollars a month. And when the insurance companies stop paying for your for your drug, and you stop taking them drug, what happens? The way all the weight comes back with a vengeance. Um, you haven't learned anything. You haven't learned anything about healthy eating. And what's the long term effect of this? Do these people really have fewer heart attacks and diabetes and strokes? Nobody knows. Uh, all they're focus on focusing on is the weight loss. Uh, and for this unphysiologic, very expensive, temporary, uh, I won't even call it a fix, uh, this temporary effect, when all you really need to do is keep your belly full of whole plant foods, of soups and salads and veggies and, and stews and, and uh, chilies. And the calorie density, density of whole plant foods is so low, it's mostly fiber and water, that automatically you're taking in less calories, even though you're eating lots of delicious foods. The people would just go on a plant-based diet. None of this would be necessary. And that money could be used to send kids to college, to fix the roads, to put internet in everybody's houses. It's such a waste. And there's and the underlying dishonesty of it, if they're not really talking about food, then the then the uh, the deception, the the milk, uh, the miscarriage of, of honest communication is, is you can eat anything you want. You can eat all the cheeseburgers you want, eat all the pieces you want. You're still going to lose weight. And so people eat all these unhealthy foods. But what's they lose weight. But what's happening to their arteries? What's happening to their colon wall as far as cancer risk? What's happening to their bone marrow? What's happening to their immune system as, the, as all the, the meat and the oils and the dairy keep flooding through the tissues? Oh, but I'm losing weight, so I can keep eating this. The, the dishonesty of that that's going to lead these people into these dreadful diseases. Once they have their stroke, you may have lost 15 pounds, but you had a big old stroke right at the end of it. Well, how have we helped these patients? Isn't this uh, uh, um, dishonesty, uh, deception of, of the highest level? And it's the betrayal of the doctor-page relationship just for a short-term effect. So am I a big fan of these drugs? No, I, I'm not. And, it sounds uh, like you are not. No, I am not. You will not see, you look at my medicine cabinet, you will not see one syringe uh, with Ozempic or Wigovi in it. I and, you know, there are so many drugs that get approved and then 10, 15 years later, we hear, whoops, whoops, it causes this or that. I mean, there was Vioxx. Uh, oh, so there were those ones for the heart rhythm. Uh, uh, right. I think it was a weight loss drug. And Defenfen. Yeah, yeah Fenfen, -fen, yeah, yeah, Vioxx. Yeah, I call it the they, big oops. Oops, yeah. we didn't realize that. They don't know what it does 15, 20 years later. Exactly. And we're running this big experiment. 
Yeah. And uh, the folks who make the drug, oh, they're they're having a great old time. They're, they're laughing all the way to the bank. But these now people you mentioned, are getting healthier. You mentioned the important truth that plant foods are full of fiber and water. Uh, fiber and sometimes you hear that there are three macronutrients, fat, carbohydrate, and protein. Other lists, and I like to say this, there are five, fiber and water. And I'm going to teach you something now, Dr. Clapper, that you probably okay. didn't know. Dr. Glenn Merzer, no, I'm not really a doctor, has come up with the sixth macronutrient. So I will tell you what that is after we get through the five. We will, we will conclude this fascinating interview with Dr. Michael Clapper with a review of the six macronutrients and which are better obtained with a plant-based versus an animal-based diet. So let's start with water. Water's important, isn't it? Uh, did you ever see dehydrated patients during your career? Oh, for sure. And many people have a low-grade state of dehydration. They're just walking around with it. They're, they're so used to it. We, they eat so little uh, they consume so little water and, and no one needs to drink eight glasses a day. I think that, that's way excessive. But one of the beauties of it, the, the diet that you and I are advocating, um, it's full of water. It's a high water content diet. All the soups and the salads and steamed veggies and the fruits are full of water. Yeah. And so just eating the food, you're, you're, you're drinking a, a quart of water during the day. And the apple is something like 90% water by weight. Absolutely. And it's pure the purest water on the planet it's plant purified water absolutely absolutely now you get a little water when you eat meat because the carcasses that are hanging in the slaughterhouse get rinsed and so you get what they call the retained water which is the water used to wash the the animal feces off the slabs of meat so you have a choice of plant purified water or retained water from the slaughterhouse. I vote for the plant purified water. I'm with you. And and also when you eat grains, what do you do? You boil them in water and you get all that water. So when it comes to water, clearly plants. All right, let's go with fiber. Where would you rather get your fiber? From plants that have it or animals that don't? Duh. The okay, we're going, the, Duh. We're, yes. we're going with the plant. And, and the thing is, oh, even over your medical career of, of decades now, uh, four or five decades in medicine, have you seen more and more studies about the benefits of fiber? Oh, it's hard to open a medical journal these days without seeing some reference to the advantages of a high fiber diet. Yeah, that and, was not uh, taught so much 40 or 50 years ago. Definitely right? not. Definitely right. so not. We know we know more now. And Dr. Will Bolshevitz has that wonderful book, Fiber Fueled. We know more and more about the how important fiber is. Never mind where do you get your protein? Where do you get your fiber? That's the important question. So water, advantage plants, fiber, advantage plants. Where would you rather get your fat? From a steak? or from a flaxseed? No question. Uh, I'll take it from the flaxseeds. Um, they've got far more omega-3 fats with their anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, and they don't have a whole lot of saturated fat, which fans inflammation and can uh, injure artery walls. Uh, and of course, the fats, the saturated fats in animals uh, comes in with cholesterol and all the cooked animal muscle proteins and all that pathogenic uh, uh, marauders that uh, that flood the tissues of every meat-based meal. So no, no question, the, the flax seeds and their ilk, the chia seeds, hemp seeds, whatever, they are, are a much more benign source of, uh, of omega-3 fats without question. All right, that brings us to carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. Now, the word carbohydrate has been misapplied and people think that carbs make them fat. And people say, oh, I'm cutting down on carbs. And let's be clear about it. People don't know what they're talking about when they say cut down on carbs. If they think, if sometimes they're using carbs as a synonym for flour. 
So if you don't want to eat bread and pancakes and cupcakes and uh, pastries, fine. Bread can be healthy if it's whole wheat, whole grain bread. Um, but those other th things, you know, and and there are better pancakes and worse pancakes. But, you know, nobody's making the case for cupcakes and pastries and croissants. Um, so those are floury foods and they often contain fat. So people call them carbs, but they're often made with butter and, and, and they're made with uh, oil. And of course, they're made with sugar, which is a carb. It's pure carbohydrate and it's very unhealthy. So when we say carbohydrate, we are not talking about eating sugar because that's not healthy. We're not talking about the sugar equivalents. We are talking about whole foods that happen to be high in carbohydrate, like the potato or the sweet potato. Even most vegetables are more carbohydrate than anything else. So I asked you before, would you rather get your, your fiber from a plant or an animal and there's no fiber in animal foods? Would you rather get your carbohydrate from a sweet potato or a steak? And the answer is... Sweet potato any day. There's no, no carbohydrate even in a steak, right? There's glycogen in the in the animal's muscle, but even okay. so, it's, co it's cooked glycogen. It's oxidized glycogen. It's um, full of AGEs, advanced glycation end products. You don't want to eat uh, cooked animal muscle, no doubt. Yeah. So the healthy carbohydrate, the fuel for the human body, the brain runs on glucose, advantage plants. Absolutely. That brings us to the calling card for animal foods, protein. protein. They're very big wow. on protein, those paleo people. So where would you rather get your protein from plants or animals? Um, I asked my friend the elephant and the buffalo and the gorilla and the giraffe who grow these magnificently muscular bodies on all plant foods, where you get your protein, Mr. Elephant? Well, of course, it's in the it's in the plants growing out of the ground. They are all proteins, all amino acids are made by plants. Uh, and there's plenty of them in uh, in the whole plant-based diet that these animals eat and is available to us in the beans and peas and chickpeas and lentils and nuts and seeds and whole grains. There are plenty of protein. Uh, if you are eating 2,000 calories in whole plant foods, you are guaranteed of getting 60, 70, 80 grams of high-grade protein with all the amino acids. You, you, can't, you can't avoid it. It's in the food. Now, as you're saying, if you're living on um, granola bars and Twinkies and, and, and cola drinks, yes, you can shortchange yourself of protein. But that key, with, uh, with the reason we don't say vegan as much as whole food, plant-based, if you're eating you know, rice and beans and greens and fruits and veggies, you're going to get the protein you need. It's just not an issue. I, I can't remember ever writing the diagnosis protein deficiency on anybody's uh, medical chart. So um, it's not an issue. Eat your, your all your foods from whole, the whole plant kingdom and the protein will take care of itself. Well, not only is the protein more than sufficient on a plant-based diet, or obviously legumes are rich in protein, but there's something wrong with animal protein, isn't there? Indeed, uh, not friendly for us. Uh, why? Um, when you eat a piece of animal muscle, uh, one, uh, I previously mentioned, um, the liver responds by putting out a surge of this growth-promoting hormone, IGF-1, that, uh, that, that promotes cancer growth throughout the body. But also the, uh, the meat itself, the, the animal muscle, uh, is full of phosphates and sulfates. These form acids in the body, phosphoric acid, sulfuric acid, that the kidneys have to neutralize, the bones have to neutralize. And, and meat full of amino acids that are quickly absorbed after you eat the burger. Um, uh, this is not friendly to the kidneys. All of a sudden, the surge of amino acids from the steak sort of flows through the kidneys and 
forces the kidney filter membranes into this state called hyperfiltration. And it's, it, it's stressful and damaging to the kidney membranes. They thicken in response. And as the months and years go by on these high protein diets, um, the, the folks will wind up with decreased kidney failure and uh, decreased kidney function, or early kidney failure. Uh, we're not carnivorous apes. We are plant eating hominids. The, the, uh, the protein in plant foods and beans and peas, they're absorbed very slowly and they're much less acidic and they're really what our bodies were designed to run on. So protein, 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 uh, the concept's really doing us a disservice. As you say, the focus should be on getting your fiber from whole plant foods. Uh, eat uh, plenty of food, eat to your hearts and stomach's content uh, and, your, uh, and the protein will take care of itself in, in a much more benign and gentle manner. And if you eat animal foods three or more times a day and you're flooding your body with protein, does that serve any purpose to have a, 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 an Absolutely excess not. of protein in the body? Absolutely. We can't store it. And it creates these acids that on the way out uh, forces the the kidney, uh, the bones to give up their calcium uh, to neutralize the, the acids. It may be a contributing factor to osteoporosis. It's just not the natural diet for, for homo sapiens. Uh, we are planting the hominids and we need to honor that. All right. So we've gone over the fiber, water, carbohydrate, fat. Uh, we've, did we talk about fat? We talked about that flax seed versus animals. Fat, yes, yep. that's right. We did fat. We did. So we did, we've done them all. We've done them all. But there is a six macronutrient that I discovered. Oh, because the macronutrients are what you need to live, what you yes. need to thrive. Yes. So do you know what the six macronutrient is, doctor? The six macronutrient is optimism. You need say, optimism yeah. to live. You need optimism. Yeah. And what is optimistic about a slaughterhouse? You know, what is optimistic about a slab of dead meat? When you look at a plate of fruits, you get a fruit salad, you see all those colors, that inspires optimism. And when you think about a healthy planet that we could have if we were all eating plant foods, instead of animal foods. If we think of the forests we could have instead of the barren deserts from chopping down the trees so the, so the cows could graze. It's a much more optimistic world if you eat plants rather than foolishly eat animals. So I oh, say that is the sixth macronutrient. I'm sticking with it. There are six macronutrients. The sixth one is optimism and you're better off with plants. Glenn, that's a beautiful concept, and I'm I'm not going to make fun of it at all. That's a, that's I think absolutely essential and and very visionary. Good for you, and I'm <laughs> going to borrow that one. We we need wow. to. Why are we getting out of bed in the morning? What what are we doing here on this planet? We're here to love and laugh and learn and feel optimistic about this life we have. Well, there you go. If I ever get a Wikipedia entry, it'll say Glenn Merzer, discoverer of the oh. six macronutrients. Here, here, I'm all for that. So, Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Everyone, please go to Dr. Clapper, spell out drclapper.com. See his video on what I wish I learned in medical school. Go to movingmedforward.com if you could afford to make a contribution to his 501c3. Please do. Michael, Michael thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Glenn, and all the best to you and your wonderful viewers. Bye-bye. This has been the Glenn Mercer Show, where everyone listening turns vegan, regains their health, and annoys their friends and relatives. Find us on YouTube at the Glenn Mercer Show and across all your major podcast platforms. Don't forget to subscribe.